The tax reform plan is a package deal that much finance chief Carlos Dominguez has made clear, meaning to say there is no getting around higher levies on certain things. To talk more, we brought in none other than finance undersecretary Carl Kendrick Chua, who happens to be one of the chief architects of the plan. Undersecretary, welcome to the show. Thank, uh, you. thank you for joining us. So the overarching message there of finance Sec uh, secretary Dominguez is that we have to take the good with the bad. Um, but he also himself has said it, that there's no getting around the concessions. This will require concessions. One of the things that analysts had pointed out to us was that the danger was that it gets too watered down to be truly effective. Is that a fair assessment? Well, I think um, everyone has concerns, and we have spent the last uh, seven months listening to people's concern. So in September, we uh, proposed a bill to Congress, and they reviewed it, and we consulted with over a 1,000 stakeholders. So now we have come down to what we think is a acceptable uh, bill that can uh, you know, alleviate concerns, but uh, at the same time move this country forward. So I'd like to correct that this is not a good replacing with a bad, or a bad replacing with a good. I think this is all good for the country because this is really part of our anti-poverty and anti-inequality uh, uh, strategy. At this stage, do you feel like you've taken out all of the politically sensitive provisions? Well, there were two major provisions that were sensitive. One is the removal of the VAT exemption for senior, senior citizens, citizens and PWD. You know, we, we are really concerned about these people, but we do not think that the benefit should come from the VAT exemption because of so many leakages. So we are actually willing to use the money that we uh, generate to give back to the poor uh, through better and higher socialized pension. The other one is the six peso increase in oil excise. Uh, why six peso? Because this is the amount that was eroded by inflation for 20 years of non-adjustment. And now we have uh, agreed and we hear the people, so we are staggering it uh, over three, three years. So you lost the battle with the exemptions for senior citizens. So what's going to happen with the excise well, taxes? Uh, not really. What we are proposing is uh, we will keep the exemptions, but instead of the local governments issuing the ID, which are not secure, there's no biometrics, and it's just a cardboard or laminated, we're going to propose that a national ID be the basis for addressing these leakages. So we are uh, working with Congress on that. Under Secretary, when you talk about the, the balance here, you've got a, a planned reduction of 5% for the income taxes, but then you're shoring it up with different levers. There's VAT, there's excise tax, mm -hmm. which you talked about on a staggered basis. What levers do you have to hedge just in case Congress does a little more populism and whitt whittles down or dilutes the bill a little further? Well, you know, um, the VAT, uh, let me start by saying the VAT system in this country is highly distorted. We, have we 59... actually have that chart showing yeah, okay. that we have amongst the most number <laughs> yes. of VAT exemptions so we, across we Asia. Take a look at yeah. that. In the tax code, we have 59 lines of exemptions. And outside the tax code, we counted almost 60 special laws exempting various products or groups from the VAT. Compare that with other countries, Indonesia, Thailand, Vietnam, average of 30. Uh, and what that means is uh, we have to charge a higher VAT rate to uh, collect the same amount of revenue as a percent of GDP compared to these countries. So the idea here is how do we make the VAT system fairer? And the, the, the reality is uh, once you make it uh, simple, it becomes easier to administer. Yeah, we talk about the administration of it as well. <coughs> once you get this down, what are your revenue projections here in terms of being able to secure more, at least with that lever of VAT alone? Right, so um, if we are able to uh, collect everything uh, that we are proposing, given the reduction in the number of exemptions, we are looking around 92.5 billion. This is uh, still less than the 139.6 billion that we are giving back to the people in the form of lower income tax. And uh, so that is why we're proposing uh, two other taxes, the oil and automobile excises. These are very progressive and pro-health and pro-environment. And we're actually taking a look at uh, your uh, other projected numbers. If uh, by the first, second, rather second half of 2017, if the plan is implemented by June, you're expected to generate at least 41 and a half. And the second column right there talks about the legislation on administration, on tax right. reform administration. Mm -hmm. By 2018, that takes us to 162 and 44. Uh, to add up to 206.8 right. mm -hmm. billion pesos in total. Um, but again, as you said, when, uh, sorry, I want to come back to that uh, chart on the VAT exemptions, 59 you said. Mm -hmm. Is there a figure in your head as to how much you want to bring that down to? Well, ideally, uh, the VAT system should work as follows. You have a low rate and then you exempt only the most essential products, so raw food, uh, education, and uh, you know, health 
So that, that is really the target in the long term. But let's do it slowly. Let's first remove the exemptions that uh, we do not think have good economic basis or can be better or the benefit can be better provided by through the budget system by providing social assistance or subsidies. The moment you insert in the VAT system exemptions and you allow people to uh, abuse the VAT system okay, by so the arbitrary nature correct, of the correct, correct. Is there an ideal figure in, in your mind? Well, you know, uh, for a start, let's get closer to Thailand because Thailand has a 7% VAT. And so closer to 35. Right. And Thailand and the Philippines, we collect 4.2% of our GDP in VAT. But they, they can do it with 7 and we do it with 12%. So let, let's look at Thailand as a Also benchmark. because they have higher collection measures. Higher they, collection rates, rather, not measures. They rates. have higher collection rate, uh, partly because they have lower number of exemptions. And it's also the wider base that you're looking at. Right, right. Now, so there's no discretion. Now, talk about the wider base. On a broader picture, you're looking at a tax to GDP ratio. We, we spoke about this earlier, uh, at around 13.6%. Right. That's mm -hmm. still far from the, F, the previous high, or the Ramos administration high of 17%. Mm -hmm. What other measures beyond the legislation are you looking at to be able to shore that figure up? Well, you know, we're looking at three uh, measures. Uh, number one is we want to do tax policy. And we have a program of reform, five packages. But uh, for now, we have submitted the first package. And this is very important. So that will generate around uh, additional 1% of GDP. Now, uh, administration is a second. It's how good we do our uh, collection. So we are proposing a lot of anti-smuggling uh, uh, mechanisms. We are going to introduce mandatory fuel marking so that we catch the smuggled fuel. We will look at e-commerce. Uh, this is one area that has been left out and I think this is uh, one area that has to be folded in into the tax system. So e-commerce are both customs and the BIR? Right. And how would you tax the, that sector? Well, you know, currently uh, the main uh, receipt that is uh, recognized is, are the paper receipts. We, we don't really recognize the e-receipts properly. And, uh, you know, our systems in the government and in BIR uh, have been left out by technology. So we're going to ramp that up. For instance, we are proposing that the medium and large firms, their point of sale machine and their accounting system be connected uh, real time to BIR so that we can monitor the... Uh, and then the third one is really we want to simplify the entire tax system. We want uh, smaller taxpayers to fill up one page form instead of four pages. And we want to ensure that they're not treated uh, the same as large ones. So, so one of our increase compliance, increase base. Right, right. And but in fact, one of our proposal is if you are a micro taxpayer, instead of paying the income tax and the VAT or the percentage tax, and you do this quarterly, they now only pay 8% uh, on their gross sales once a year. So that that's will simplify. Really, that's really more of a carrot approach, isn't it? Do we yeah, need well, to we offset need, that with need, a stick approach both. too? Yeah, we need both. I think most taxpayers are honest, but they cannot comply with this maze of exemptions and procedures. So let's maze begin with that. Maze is certainly right. Let's come yeah. back to the fuel excise taxes. Mm -hmm. um, is this a good time to be doing so, considering that um, inflation is on the uptake? Mm -hmm. Global crude prices are also marching higher. Well, you know, we have not adjusted for 20 years exactly because we didn't want the economy to bear a big burden. But, you know, in the last 10 years, this economy has turned around significantly. This is the highest growing uh, country in the region, uh, investment grade uh, rating. Uh, you know, this economy can manage. We have seen our per capita income double in the last 10 years. And inflation is going up, but it's still very low. It is... Uh, what, 2.3 uh, or 2.6 percent. Uh, this is far from the 5 or 10 percent that we have been experiencing. So this is an economy that can manage this what, transition. What you guys are claiming is that the burden is going to go towards the higher income right. uh, you know, uh, automobile mm -hmm. owners rather mm -hmm. than the, let's say, jeepney drivers. Well, uh, let's look at the facts. Um, the top 10% of Filipinos, they consume already 50% of oil products. The top 1% consume 13%. Now, even if the bottom 90% consume the other half, they remember, they share the Jeep with 20 other passengers. They share the bus with 40 other passengers. So the impact is very minimal. Plus, uh, we are giving back uh, a lot of the money as social assistance so to help them mitigate this temporary increase in price. Okay, fair point. You're putting a progressive slant to it. Now, the associated industry there is cars. I mean, you, you've got the DTI trying to push for a cars program, and mm -hmm. then this excise tax is looming on, over their heads. Question is, how do you balance the, the, the goal for industrialization at the same time, make sure that it's a progressive tax that benefits the user? Okay, well, um, um, well, we have to look at the tax reform that we're proposing as a package. First of all, uh, those people who will buy cars are the same people who will see a significant decline in their tax uh, rates. Uh, the average person, uh, call center for instance, will see a 20,000 uh, increase in take-home pay. 
and the average will be around 40,000 per household with two workers. Again, so, we have that case right, study so actually. If call center agent earned uh, 273,000 mm -hmm. annual gross income, for instance, mm -hmm. under the current scheme, they're paying some 21,867. Right. And um, in your case study, under the proposed scheme, they will tax you will be zero. Zero, correct. So um, in the sense, even if we increase the oil excise, even if we increase the petroleum, as rather the automobile and broaden the VAT, you know, these are fully compensated, uh, more than compensated by the increase in the take-home pay of the uh, people through lower income tax. So uh, the, the other reason is, you know, we are a fast-growing economy. When the oil price uh, almost doubled, actually more than doubled in 2010, you know, people still bought cars, traffic continued to Person. So tax is only one component, but the income is another component. People are, you know, getting richer, and the real income can afford this. So the second thing on that offset, I mean, beyond that offset, you're also keeping it until the the end line where you're saving the export sector. Export sector is not going to be taxed on this. Well, you know, the export sector, uh, they are under the VAT system, zero rated. So, and then we are going to work on a proper refund system because that is their main complaint. Uh, the problem with the VAT now is not only are the direct exporters zero rated, we also zero rate their suppliers, their agents, and that causes some confusion. So we'll do the VAT system properly. And you want to tax the suppliers, but do a cash back for the exporters. Right. So that is exactly how a VAT system should work. So Last thing, uh, um, Under Secretary, if the goal is to ensure consistent revenue stream in the automobile tax, wouldn't it make more sense to make it an annual tax as opposed to a one-time uh, bump when you, uh, the, a tax, additional tax on top of the existing sales tax at the point of sale mm -hmm. um, because especially you, you could do it uh, in a way where you tax based on say emissions or the engine size because the way it will work is the new vehicles so the more uh, let's say a Tesla would be mm -hmm. taxed more than the older uh, diesel vehicles so that okay so that's correct so we have um, we also have that in mind but this is not a tax this is called a motor vehicle user charge that is what you pay every year when you register. So we have not adjusted that for 13 years since 2004. So we are also looking at that. So it's fair to everyone for the new buyers and the current users because they're all the same cost of congestion and pollution. So, so we although we that. call it a car tax, auto tax, it's really a motor usage vehicle tax. Uh, the, when you buy a car, that, that is considered a tax. When you register, you pay the fee. So this is the uh, registration right. so, tax so, for so it. So both sides have. I love you. 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 I love you.